All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to session 11 of a sports betting education. I'm your host and instructor, Waz from Better IQ. And this is our final week of the course of sports betting education. Uh, we have the session tonight here, and then we have Thursday. Uh, and I'll tell you guys in a minute here about a little bit more possibly after this. Uh, but we're going to continue to talk about football, handicapping football. I'm going to kind of put a bow on the NFL and, and, and you know, went through that the last three sessions, talked a lot about NFL. Uh, we're going to transition into college football a little more today with Eddie Walls. So we'll be on here in about uh, 25 minutes or so. So Eddie's going to share his perspective, which is terrific in college football. He's, he's definitely one of the best out there. Uh, so he'll be on here in a little bit to chat with us. Uh, I want to mention Sports Better Supporting COVID-19 Healthcare Heroes, which is our campaign that we're running throughout this course. Uh, there's a link on the betteriq.com course page where you can donate um, if you want to do that. So definitely have a lot of great donations so far. I appreciate that from everybody. Uh, remember also, if you have any questions at all today during the session, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom. Go ahead and fire those away whenever you have a question. Uh, they'll accumulate and then I'll go through those in the last 15 minutes or so with Eddie. Um, there's a couple housekeeping items I want to touch on uh, before I jump into the material for today. So I've been getting a lot of questions from uh, people in the course asking if, if this is kind of the end of it this week or if there's going to be more, kind of what's next um, with, with the sessions here. And there will be more. The answer is there will be more. I'm still kind of figuring out exactly, um, you know, what that means. But I think there's a lot of opportunities still. We've, we've, you know, a lot of these studies, we kind of went surface level, didn't really go as deep as I wanted to in a lot of areas. And, you know, the biggest component is just time. You know, we're, we're doing two sessions a week for an hour each, actually more like an hour, 15, hour, 20 each. Um, there's only so much we can cover in that time. So um, there's a lot of areas I want to dig deeper in and really get into and really have you guys understand them even better with some examples and actually walk through games from kind of start to finish to understand how everything kind of fits in, how you apply a lot of techniques you've kind of learned over here over the last six weeks. So we're going to definitely have more in store here soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. I'll have an announcement on that probably uh, sometime next week. Um, so you probably, if you haven't followed me on Twitter yet, follow me on Twitter. I have more information coming out uh, about future courses here very, very soon. Um, the other thing I want to mention too is, you know, I really enjoy the teaching aspect of, of this, just teaching in general. You know, throughout my whole life, I've always liked teaching people um, it's, a, it's a big passion of mine, and, and it's really the reason why I started Better IQ in a lot of ways, to help educate people about sports betting, give them the right information, the right tools. And I've worked like one-on-one -on -one with a handful of sports bettors, you know, over the years. Um, you know, I don't have a bunch of free time usually. Uh, I usually have a couple of people I work with on the side here and try to get them to a certain level. Um, but right now, given the current situation, I do have a little more time than usual. So... Um, I can help more betters one-on-one, -on -one, um, give them more specific guidance and, you know, help them create a sports betting plan that's kind of catered towards, you know, their strengths and, and gives them in a, a good spot to, puts them in a good spot to succeed, you know, down the road in sports betting. So if you're interested at all in any kind of one-on-one -on -one type coaching, you can email me, waz at betteriq.com. It's W-A-Z at betteriq.com. And you can, you know, reach out. We can just figure out if it makes sense or not to, to work together a little bit. Uh, but all right, let's get into the football stuff here. So there's two main areas of, you know, the NFL. This also applies to college football as well. But two main areas I haven't really touched on all that much uh, throughout the, the last few weeks, and that's coaching and injuries. We've, we've, we've touched them at a very surface level. I don't go a little bit deeper, though, uh, today and dig into that. And a lot of that will tie into what, what Eddie talks about when we bring him on to talk about college football. So um, in my opinion, there's really no sport – other than football or coaching matters more. I think it matters the most in football um, for lots of reasons. You know, there's a lot of moving parts in football. You have a big roster. You got 53 guys. You got the full practice squad. You got a large coaching staff, big organizations, a lot of money. Um, I think NFL head coaching is one of the toughest jobs in sports. And if you look at all the responsibilities that a head coach has, um, I've got a few listed here, but it's definitely not all inclusive. You know, they're, they're building and managing a strong staff. They're developing schemes with the offensive and defensive coordinators. They're watching film to study opponent tendencies, putting together a weekly game plan for the game, calling plays during the game, making tough strategy, strategy decisions during the game, um, you know, clock management throughout the game. And, you know, on top of all that, they got to command the respect of the players. Um, they got to be accountable to the media on a weekly basis. 
And they got to work with the front office quite a bit on personnel decisions. You know, maybe they're involved in the draft quite a bit or free agency. Um, some coaches are also the GM, which I, I don't even know how those guys do it, to be honest with you. There's a lot of responsibility there. So head coaches have a lot on their shoulders in the NFL and also for college as well. A little bit less so in college, but it's, it's, it's pretty insane there too. So one thing I want to emphasize before I get into this deep discussion about coaching is, you know, don't judge a head coach purely by the decisions he makes on the field during the game. Um, there's a whole, so much more that goes into head coaching than just making decisions during the game. I think it's only about maybe 20, 25% of the job is what you do during the game. I really think it's what you do before the game, the game plan, um, you know, getting to know the players, taking advantage of their strengths and weaknesses. So again, I think a lot of people make the mistake of watching games on TV and say, you know what, that coach is terrible. How did he punt there? Why didn't he go for it? You know, why, why is he making that same play call again? What's with this formation? I get it. I mean, there's coaches that make suboptimal decisions on a weekly basis in the NFL, and it's maddening. Um, but again, it's one area of the game. You know, there are coaches that excel in other areas, and they're still really good coaches. You know, like Pete Carroll comes to mind where he's he makes a lot of poor decisions during a game sometimes, but he gets his guys ready, and he motivates his guys. He, he's really good at player development. He works with the young guys quite a bit. He's very involved in very hands-on in different parts of the game. So keep that in mind. You know, there are some coaches that can kind of do it all. Um, not many, you know, Bill Belichick comes to mind, obviously kind of do a little bit of everything, uh, personnel decisions, you know, he's, he's involved in every part of the offense, the defense, special teams. Um, you know, the one area maybe argue he's a little bit weak and is dealing with the media a little bit. Um, but you know, overall he's, he's great in every area just about. So, um, you know, we don't get to see these coaches interact behind the scenes. It's, it's kind of my point. Um, we only see what happens during the, you know, during the game. So, um, you know, I think also a lot of times too, people, you know, don't give co head coaches enough credit. Sometimes they, they kind of say, well, the players in the field are doing this and doing that, but scheme is so important and play calling is so important in the NFL that, you know, if you're not putting those guys in a position to succeed on a regular basis, they're just not going to come through. So um, in evaluating head coaches, which is, is very tricky to do, I, I think in, in football, uh, you want to look at how they perform versus expectations, right? The ultimate barometer in my mind is what are expectations and do you exceed them? Do you underperform? And really, if you think about it, the best way to kind of do that is look at, you know, how they do against the spread, right? The, the market kind of tells you what expectations are every week. You know, this team's favored by seven. They should win the game by seven points. They're favored by three. They should win by more than three points. So that's your barometer. It's actually a pretty good barometer. Um, now, sample size in the NFL are very small, as I mentioned before. And I think if you take it one step further, look at cover margin, average cover margin over time, it's a little bit more predictive than the ATS record, especially over, you know, over a smaller sample size. So keep that in mind. You know, it's not the you know, end-all, be-all as far as looking at ATS and looking at cover margin. It's obviously more to it than that. Um, a lot of these coaches get so good that they start getting baked into the line a lot. Uh, but it's not always true. I mean, look at Bill Belichick, again, with the Patriots, I mean, everybody knows he's been a great coach probably for, for 15 years we've known it. And yet again, every single season, he's going like 10 and 6 against the spread, you know, 11 and 5 against the spread, 12 and 4 against the spread. The guy's at 60% ATS in his career. He's had a long career. We're talking 20 plus years. So a lot of times what happens with, with these lines is modelers and people work with numbers and, you know, analyze the rosters they sort of kind of forget that, hey, the head coach is part of this team. It's more than just the players on the field. And, you know, a lot of times those models that pick up all the quantitative stuff, they may indirectly pick up some of the head coaching stuff, but they're not directly picking it up. So it is one area I feel like you can exploit if you dig in a little bit deeper. Um, I mentioned before, betting lines are a great place to start. Um, you know, look at how they perform in certain situations. I like to break it down by how they do with extra time to prepare, less time to prepare off of a bye week early season versus late season. You can look at all these different ways to kind of break down coaches and put them in different buckets. And they all have different, you know, strengths, weaknesses. You know, some coaches are really good right out of the gate. Andy Reid's a great example. He's always good that first month of the season. I mean, his ATS record, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's got to be 60, 65% that first month of the season. Um, he tends to, you know, towards the end of the year, let up a little bit and teams kind of figure him out. He finally broke through last year, the Super Bowl win, which, which he definitely deserved. But, um, his teams usually are not as good late in the season. So, again, just knowing the coach, knowing his tendencies and where he excels is really important, I think, in, in football for sure. Um, you know, another area 
or I think there's a, a lot of th a lot of things to be gained from a handicapping standpoint is when you have a brand new coach. Um, you know, there's not in the NFL. I tend to get a lot of retreads. You know, got a coach here. You know, the Redskins need a coach. Let's go get Ron Rivera because he coached for eight years at Carolina, whatever it was, and he did a decent job. You know, he's not he's not a great coach. He's not a terrible coach. But hey, he's a name, and people want names. And that happens in the NFL quite a bit where nobody wants to kind of roll the dice on an unknown commodity. So they'll end up taking a really highly touted, you know, defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, or a retread coach that's, you know, got fired somewhere else. Um, not the kind of decisions I would be making as a GM necessarily. Um, but hey, I, I get it. You know, that their job security is important as a GM. So they want to get somebody that's, that's known and count on, um, you know, but if you get a brand new coach, that maybe he's only coached like special teams or maybe a little bit on offense, but not, not that many years. If you really dig into those guys and really study their background, you know, you can kind of figure out maybe how they run the offense or what they'll, they let the DC just take over and not even bother with the defense. Are they, are they really focused on details and special teams? Just do a lot of reading. I, I find like in, in, in many sports, not just football, where if you get to know these brand new coaches really well, you have an edge over the market, especially those first three, four, five weeks of the season. And a lot of people aren't doing that where if they kind of learn on the fly with those coaches, you get a little bit ahead of the curve there and find some, some edges for sure. Um, and then what you want to do too is, at least what I do is, Watch those first few games of that new coach. I always, if there's a brand new coach in the NFL, I know there's a few this year, I'll record all those games. You know, I'll, I'll watch, I'll fast forward parts and whatnot, but I'll definitely watch those games and see, you know, what is he doing? Is he making a lot of adjustments? Is it very vanilla? Is he being very creative? I like guys who are creative and do, you know, things that aren't expected. Um, you get a feel after watching two, three, four games of a guy. And then after that, you can kind of say, okay, I think this is what he is. And this kind of monitor from that point on. So keep that in mind. The other thing in the NFL and college football is the coordinators, they matter a lot. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, the offensive coordinator is given free reign to make all the play calls, you know, work with the offense out through all the practices and the coach gets involved a little bit, but it's more, hey, I'm more of a defensive coach. You do the offense, I'll focus more on the defense. So there are some cases where the coordinators are more important than the head coach. Uh, I think more so in college, probably in the NFL, but in the NFL too, you know, some coaches just are really good on one side of the ball. You want to know what side of the ball that is. You want to know how good are the coordinators, right? So it pays to dig into the coordinator's background and just look at simple things like, hey, here's a new DC. Um, he coached, you know, maybe in college or in the NFL at, you know, three or four different stops. What were the average defensive ranks when he was on those staffs? Did they rate high? Did they rate low? You want to get a good feel for where, what he's good at. Are they good at stopping the run? Are they good at stopping the pass? Uh, that they create a lot of turnovers. You know, the, the more you dig into these coaches and understand them, I think that the better off you are heading into a season, especially with a new coach. Because again, the market's not going to know what to do. What's the market going to do? They're probably going to take what what happened last year until they get a good feel for the coach and how he's changing things. So you get a lot of change with a new coach. Change equals opportunity in, in all sports. As a handicapper, you want change. You don't want things being the same all the time. Uh, when they become the same and consistent all the time, the market figures them out and is no longer an edge. So again, new coaches create new opportunities. New coordinators create new opportunities as well. Especially on totals, by the way. If you're looking at size versus totals, um, you tend to find a little bit more there early on in the season with a new coach when you're looking at, at totals because again, it, you know, pace, tempo, plays, things like that. I mean, they all they all play a role, and that's really a big edge you can have early on. We'll get more, a little bit more with coaches here with, with Eddie here in a little bit. Let's talk about injuries, though. And there's a lot to digest for injuries. I'm not going to be able to get through all this material that I want to today. Um, but injuries are a huge source of, of an advantage, I think, in, in football. There's a ton of injuries. They rack up faster than they do in any other sport, especially once you get past, like, week eight, week nine. You know, there's injury reports that have 15, 20 guys on them sometimes in the middle of the season. I remember the Jets last year, I think by week four, they had, like, 15 guys out, and half of them were starters. So, again, it's the one sport where if you really become like an injury expert, I feel like you can create a big edge. You know, it's not uncommon, like I said, to see a ton of guys in the injury report. And, and, you know, when a quarterback's out for a team, everybody knows it, right? You know, if Aaron Rodgers isn't playing this week, <laughs> everybody's talking about it. It's a big story. The line's already been moved five, six points, whatever it is. The media's all over it, right? Um, the lines makers have a decent feel for quarterbacks, how to adjust the number. It's not rocket science for quarterbacks. But you start looking at other areas of the field, um, even key positions out there, it's really tough for, for handicappers and bookmakers to figure out what's, how do you quantify when 
the all pro starting center is out and the backup is an unknown that hasn't played more than 100 snaps in his career or something. I mean, how do you quantify that? What's it worth? It's easy for a quarterback. I feel like you can dig in the numbers a little bit, but there are no numbers for a center, you know, very, very few numbers. There are some numbers, but they're not, the stats for them aren't very uh, comprehensive, right? It doesn't take into account how well they block and things like that. And you can look at, there are stats out there to look at units on the field. So Football Outsiders has offensive line numbers for the whole unit, right? Um, defensive back numbers. So there are some ways to break down the unit. When you get to one player being out, that's tricky. Um, it's not easy to do. So a couple of the things I do is I'm big on depth charts. So I have essentially a good feel for, okay, if this guy's out, this guy's coming in. There's a bunch of sites out there you can look at depth charts on. You want to know who the backup is, first of all, because you might say hey, this all pro starting center is, is probably worth a point of the line, which which he could be. But if the guy coming in from behind, you know, is, is pretty good too. He needs to st- you know, for whatever reason, isn't playing, but he's, he's adequate. Maybe he could start on half the teams in the NFL. That's not a huge drop off. Whereas if it's a rookie guy that hasn't played, you know, it's a totally different story. So again, with injuries, you want to know not only who's out, but who the backup is. And when it comes down to kind of getting a feel for, you know, what that guy's worth, it, it's tricky. It's a lot more art than it is science. But you want to look at some of the sites that, that track ratings for players. You know, I'm a big fan of Pro Football Focus. They have player ratings for every single player in the field. So they make, they essentially grade the performance of all 22 guys in every snap. They have different guys scouting and watching. They grade every play. And at the end of the game, they put out a grade for that game. Like, hey, this guy was an 82. Um, And they keep track of that throughout the season. They adjust the ratings. Um, The Madden ratings for the video game, Madden football, those are pretty good. They're not bad. They have a pretty good team over there. Uh, at EA Sports analytics team that, that builds those numbers and their ratings are updated every single week. They're free. They're online and you can look at player ratings. So if you, hey, the starting safety of, you know, Baltimore's out. Let me go see what Madden has him rated. Oh, he's an 89. That's pretty good. The guy coming in for him is looking like a 71. That's a big drop off. It gives you at least an idea of what this guy's worth, right? Um, be careful of that a little bit because a lot of times, you know, if the starting safety's out, maybe the free safety will come over and take his spot. And then another guy will come in and, and, and backfill, essentially. So you might not know exactly how it's going to play out, but you at least get an idea by looking at some of those individual player ratings in the NFL. For college, it's much trickier because college, they don't have, uh, at least I know of any site that rates all the players, including the backups, to be able to plug in and know what a guy's worth. So that's a little bit trickier. Um, but it, like I said, it's, it's better than nothing to at least know, okay, there's eight guys out. I get an idea of the player rating. I get an idea who's coming for them. And then put it all together and say, you know, how does that compare to what they normally have out there? You're going to have injuries every week in the NFL for every team, um, you know, at least a handful every week. So if you spend, you know, I, I spend probably 40 to eh, maybe 30 to 40% of my time handicapping games in the NFL and injuries um, because it's a lot there to dig into. Um, I always usually read when the key players are out, you know, how the coach is going to deal with that, if they're going to change the scheme at all, maybe, or do something a little differently. They usually don't tell you outright, but sometimes you can read between the lines a little bit. Um, but assessing injuries is, is, is real, like I said, much more an art uh, than it is a science. And, and you got to know, in my opinion, like the key positions that matter the most. You know, obviously quarterback, they already mentioned. Uh, the center is really important in the NFL. The whole offensive line is really important. But the left tackle, um, the blind side for the quarterback is obviously very key a right tackle if he's left-handed. So those guys are really key. Um, you know, shutdown corners are really valuable in the NFL. If you have a shutdown corner who takes away almost half the field, he's out, you know, that's that's massive, right? So um, some of the lesser valuable positions of linebackers usually, um, you know, a tight end, an offense, sometimes receivers, depending on the scheme and, and who's out. Um, so get an idea of what each position's worth is, is, is really important. And I think it'll, with experience, that'll sort of come um to know who's more important than other guys so i think I, like i said i think you should invest a decent amount of time here um looking at injury reports and we look at the injury reports as well you got to be careful because you know you see probables and questionables doubtfuls out for some teams questionable means something else right so some teams when they say questionable he's 99 percent of the time going to play they just put him on there because they want to make sure they're all inclusive of putting every guy on there the other teams might put questionable in the guy that plays 65% of the time. Uh, the NFL puts guidelines out, right? Every, every team is given these guidelines to follow, you know, what dictates a questionable versus a, a, a doubtful. 
And teams do their best to follow those guidelines, but I think certain teams try to game the system a little bit too. Like the Patriots, for instance, they put a lot of guys on the injury report that, you know, end up playing and they've got sucked in the wrist a little bit with that and change over the last few years. But you can look at the histories of, of some of these teams and see, you know, who does it more than others as far as exploiting the system a little bit. So keep that in mind too, just because a guy says doubtful for some teams that guy might play one out of five times, other teams is 0% of the time. So just keep that in mind. You'll get to know that when you know the organizations and the coaches a little bit, they kind of play games uh, here and there. So other thing too, with, with injuries, I feel like is, most people kind of forget, they're quick to forget when a guy comes back. So let's just say you had your starting middle linebacker. He's been out for the first six weeks of the season. He's no longer on the injury report anymore. He disappeared from the injury report and he's in there. And unless you're looking at prior injury reports and looking at the current one to kind of compare and say, well, who's not on there anymore? If you're not reading about that, that, that team or that game, you might not even know that the guy's coming back. So I like to chart all the players who've been out and then have it, go throughout the whole season, I have a little chart week by week. I kind of see who's out and when and when they came back. A lot of times the team can get a lot better in the middle of the season just because three or four guys come back. And again, you just kind of forget if you're, if you're not looking um, at the game logs or looking at, you know, week by week, you kind of forget that they got, you know, three or four key guys back. So it's not just about who's on the injury report now. It's about who was on the injury report before and comparing that to now. So it's a really key point there. Um, and again, it's not an exact science. Don't focus on trying to make really precise measurements with those players. Just get it directionally right. Um, you know, most players are going to be a half a point or less. Um, one thing I'll say is there are sometimes you get cluster injuries, which is basically you get three, four, five guys out at a certain position. So let's say a team's uh, defensive backfield gets really banged up and they have three starters out and maybe another backup is out as well. They're playing with guys from the practice squad all of a sudden. You know, that's a huge red flag. Maybe those guys individually are only worth a fraction of a point. When you add up four or five of them, all of a sudden there might be two points of value there because they have cluster injuries. So keep that in mind. Um, I don't think bookmakers in the, in, the, in the betting markets really spend as much time on, on putting those numbers together for injuries. So definitely an area you can exploit. All right, so one last thing I want to touch on here before we bring in our guest is – I want to sort of compare NFL to college football a little bit. There are some differences. There are a lot of similarities. Most of the topics that I discussed over the last few weeks with football apply to both the NFL and college football. Uh, maybe one sport more than the other, depending on what the topic is, but they definitely carry over a lot. So if you go back and listen to these last few sessions, they, they mostly apply to college football. There are some differences, though. Um, there's some big ones as well. So the one big one, or there's two really big ones. First of all, the style of play varies a lot more from team to team for college NFL. So in college, you know, you got, I mean, sorry, in the NFL, you've got a lot of pro style offenses, right? It's mostly, most teams are playing a pro style offense with a little bit of variation to that. Maybe they have different formations, maybe they spread them out a little more, but it's a pro style offense. Whereas in college, you know, the, it could be very extreme. You could get triple option teams, triple option flex bone at Army and Navy, then you can get the air raid at Washington State and everywhere in between, right? It's very diverse. So Knowing those styles of play in college is very beneficial. You know, how the team is playing the game. Um, usually it's attached to the coach or the, or the coordinators. You don't have that as much in the NFL to worry about. Um, it, there are some different schemes you run on defense and whatnot, but in the NFL is more, more like a copycat league. Once something works for one team, everybody copies it and it becomes all the same. So in college, definitely not the case. You get very extreme different styles of play and just knowing those teams in and out in college is very beneficial. The other big one is the, the talent gap. So, you know, in the NFL, if you're playing in the NFL, you're, you're a pretty good player. Um, you know, you've gone through college, you've done well, um, you know, they're not paying these guys millions of dollars to, you know, to, to not perform. So you don't see too many point spreads in the NFL higher than two touchdowns. And most of them are, are a touchdown or less. In college, on a weekly basis, we've got games that are lying 30, 35, 40 points, sometimes more. On a weekly basis, it's very it's very regular. So that talent gap creates, uh, you know, a larger standard deviation, which in many ways creates more opportunities for betters. Uh, that wider distribution makes it very much more difficult to assess performance because if Alabama's beaten up on Tulane by 55 points, what do you read into that? Um, was Alabama even playing their best? Could they beat them by 80? Maybe. <laughs> Um, maybe they only won by 21. You wonder what happened in Alabama. Maybe they just didn't take it seriously. So 
with those wire distribution outcomes, you got to be a little bit careful in college football. Um, the other thing too with, with the NFL versus college is the NFL, it's hard to find information that isn't accounted for. You're not going to find a lot of nuggets of information that are, uh, you know, these hidden gems in the NFL. Um, you, you still find them. Don't, don't get me wrong. And I, yeah, I find them on a weekly basis, but not that many. Um, in a lot of cases, they eventually get snuffed out and they're in the line. So in college, you look at some of these smaller conferences, you know, looking at like a Sunbelt team, all of a sudden the, the starting, you know, all conference safety is out. It's probably not on Don Best. If it is, it's there late, um, you know, and maybe they don't have anybody to really fill in and it's any good. And that could be a significant, you know, uh, edge there. So there's more information asymmetry there. So again, if you're going to look at injuries and look at um, just information in general, it pays off more to spend more time looking for good information in college than it does in the NFL. Um, and by a pretty wide margin. And tying into injuries as well on top of that is, you know, those teams in college usually aren't as deep as they are in the NFL. So when you, the, the, the drop off from going from a starting, let's say middle linebacker in NFL to the backup, and compare that to college, the starting linebacker to the backup, usually it's a little bit bigger in, in college. Now there's some exceptions. If you look at Alabama, they got five star recruits all over the place. So you can plug in anybody a lot of times, but some of these smaller schools, the guys hurt, it means a lot more. So again, you want to keep those things in mind, um, you know, comparing and contrasting the NFL and college football. They're not the same, but there are a lot of similarities. <clears throat> All right, so let's dig a little bit more here into college football and bring in professional sports better Eddie Walls into the discussion. Eddie, how are you doing tonight? Good, how are you? Doing all right, man. Just trying to hang in there like the rest of us here during this uh, this difficult time. How, how are you? How's life adjusting to the, uh, to the quarantine and the the shutdown here playing a lot of online poker and uh hiking every day started a garden uh got 11 onions that's all i got so far yeah what are you playing onions we got our stuff going or oh i got like 30 things going all i get is onions i don't know <laughs> basil and onions i don't eat basil and uh i have too many onions so if anybody out there needs onions let me know <laughs> yeah it seems like you're always doing something uh different i don't know how you do it all man i, I you know you're special sports better you, you play poker professionally I know you like DJ in the weekend sometimes. You go for a lot of hikes. You're always doing something different. How do you find the time for all this stuff? I have no life. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I, I don't sleep a lot, and uh, I never get tired of researching things. So if I find something interesting, I just want to do it for as long as I can, you know, until I get bored with it. But I don't think I'll ever get bored with sports or poker. Yeah. Poker evolves every three or four years, and now it's a mixed game era. And, you, you know, I can't learn enough about these new games. So it's just it's interesting. So you've, you played, you've been playing poker a lot longer than you've been betting sports, correct? 20 years this October, yeah. So what, really. what got you from going, okay, I'm, I'm playing strictly poker, and now I'm going to get into to doing sports. What, what was that journey like to eventually say, hey, I'm going to start getting into the sports realm? Well, I used to run an underground poker room here in Denver. I ran two of them for five years, and the owner was a bookie, and I would go with him collect and pay every Tuesday. That's, uh, that's whenever all of his clients would come and meet him. And he liked having me around uh, for whatever reason. I think he kind of thought of me as a son or whatever, and he took me under his wing. And uh, the same guys would lose every single week, no matter what. And then uh, one time uh, during basketball season, during football season, a college basketball player started beating him for humongous figures. And uh, I'd never seen anything like it before. I mean, just humongous, humongous figures every single week. And he would, he would cut him down in limits, and the guy would just bet more games. And he would just kept on beating him. And uh, that really struck some interest with me. And then Black Friday hit. And, um, you know, for poker players, it was the worst thing on earth. And I went, went out to the World Series and uh, went bust like two, two, two months later. And uh, college football was getting ready to begin. And I had a buddy of mine who was uh, reading Phil Steele every single day and said, hey, we're going to bet. And we got two other guys and we were square as it gets. I mean, beyond square. Uh, we didn't know anything about bankroll management. We had twenty thousand dollars between the both, uh, all four of us, and uh, we were betting a dime a game. And our goal was just to find two locks per conference because it was that easy. We were just going to find locks. <laughs> you know, we were going to take any chances, just the easy games. And um, I've been fortunate in life, but I can on honestly say that we got lucky as anybody could ever get that year. Um, that was the year of Robert Griffin. And um, the, the books couldn't keep up with the totals. And, um, you know, they were making totals in the mid-50s, and they were hitting them by halftime. And it was just like free money to us. 
um, you know, and we had a great season, but they all separated and um, I decided to keep on going because I didn't have anything else going on. They started businesses and families. And then I uh, met Dink and then Dink showed me how to read Don Best, which I literally thought was a person when he told me about Don Best. He said, <laughs> you need to get Chris and Don Best. And I literally Googled what bookie is named Chris? <laughs> like I thought that it was a person, you know? And uh, yeah, so Dink, Dink and me uh, joined a partnership back in 2012 or 2013. And I just became obsessed. I could never stop working. I, I never stopped working on college football. I probably, like right now, I'm probably doing 30 hours a week. Um, but during the season, I probably do 60 or 70 hours a week. Is college football it. something you grew up watching or what I mean what was it a conscious decision to do college football is it kind of just happened by happenstance the other guys were doing that you knew that you got into it or what why did you well, set up those on after there I was broke and I was given basically a free roll at the time I, I had uh, a ten thousand dollar bankroll and I didn't have enough money to like live uh, and, and there weren't many good poker games at the time there was just four or eight and eight sixteen local games and this guy is like talking about me joining a team and $10,000 is plenty of money. And I was so broke that I used to borrow his Phil Steele, take it to the library, photocopy it. So that way I could highlight on it because I have a learning disability. So I have to highlight everything and write it down. And uh, I didn't have any money. So I, I, you know, it was like, if he would have said we were going to bet the NFL, then we would have bet the NFL because he was smarter than me in my eyes. And, um, you know, we, we were lucky because we had, you know, a really, really good bookmaker to tell us what we were doing wrong. Um, and then we had a sharp guy, like the, the college basketball guy. He kind of befriended us in the end because we started, you know, figuring out things that he wasn't happy about. But yeah, I mean, if he would have told me we were betting on tennis, you know, and $10,000 was plenty and he was going to do all the work. I mean, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just turned into an obsession. I just fell in love with the game. We would watch the games from 10 AM. I still watch the games from 10 AM until they, you know, uh, 10 AM kickoff until two o'clock in the morning, every single day that I can, I, I never get tired of watching football. So what did you decide early on, like what type of handicapper you're going to be like, Hey, I'm going to be like this you know, information hog. I'm going to do some modeling. I'm going to watch a bunch of games or did you kind of know from the outset, like how you're going to attack it and how, what your edge is going to be based off of that? No, I mean, I, I didn't have any, you know, I, 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 I have a learning disability, so I know what I can and can't do. Um, I can't model. I don't know anything about computers. I have to have my assistant do an Excel sheet because it just takes me six hours to even figure out how to run it. Um, and you know, I, I knew right away what my strengths and weaknesses were as far as like retaining information. And I knew that if I could watch games when nobody else was watching, like Hawaii was a big earner for me in the first couple of years, because I was willing to stay up till three or four, four o'clock in the morning to watch their games. And I was willing to track every single box score of every single game that took place. And eventually I just learned how to make really, really sharp numbers. Yeah. That's so let's, let's talk about, you know, how you do some of this documentation, your notes, you got this famous notebook, this huge binder. And I, I think you said you're going to show it off here during the, uh, All right. during the class and give somebody a little peek at it. This was the first notebook. This one right oh, here. One, that one's pretty small. Uh, <laughs> and then this is last year's notebook. <laughs> and, um, nice. You can see that this is 520 pages and that was 130 pages. And every single notebook is the same thing. Um, so you have power numbers and then base totals to start at the beginning of the year. And then this is the information part of the notebook. And then I track every single box score of every single team and any information that might go along with that team as far as key plays, turnovers, and stuff like that. Um, and and the handwriting is small enough that only you could read it, I feel like, because I've seen your notebook right. a few times. I, it's I, tiny. I do do that. I, I, do do, I don't do it consciously. Um, it's just that you, you, only, you have limited space on a piece of paper when you're writing. And I try to get so much information on each, each piece of paper. I read six different uh, people every single year, and you're only as good as your information that you're given. So I take these six people and I put them all in a notebook. Three people, three authors is who end up in the notebook, and they change every single year based on last year's performance or what I like about what they do. And I always tell everybody, you have to have a square opinion and a sharp opinion. So the reason why is because if you only have sharp opinions, then your numbers they're, they're going to be sharp, but you're not going to have any public kind of opinion. So I need a Phil Steele or I need a, a, a Fudicek or I need the uh, athletic. I need those square guys. You know what I mean? Like you have to make a combined number that makes sense. So if you're only using Connolly, for instance, you know, you're going to have the same numbers as them. Right. So what, when do you start this notebook? I know you, I know you kind of do college football almost like year round, but when do you start getting into it and, and start, you know, getting your teams ready? 
Uh, honestly, uh, the third week of January. So I go out to Vegas every year. You see me every year for the championship game, me and Dink and, and, and Frank. We get together for the championship game. And then I get home and I take a week off and I usually just focus on NBA for a couple of weeks. But I'm just so passionate about the game that I'll start tracking the new coaches and grading them and grading the old coaches around the third or fourth week of January and just a couple hours a day. And then around mid-February, I'll make my first numbers of the year based upon how I feel the returning production is going to work out. And those numbers will change dramatically over the summer, but they're just my first, first number. Is there enough information out there at that time? Or are you just doing it based on, you know, going through box scores and, and your numbers from last year? What, what are you finding good info for that that early? Honestly, if I wanted to, I don't think that I would necessarily need anybody else's numbers at this point. I've been tracking numbers for seven or eight years by hand. Um, so it's, it's, it, it comes kind of, you know, I, I know that UCF is going to be better than Navy by at least six points at the beginning of the year, um, you know, and, and stuff like that. So I do it by conference by conference, and I just start grading them. And then as I read more throughout the year, then I'll change my numbers. So, so, so how long has it taken you on average to get through like a single team when you say like from the, you know, you start in January and we get all the way to August, fast forward to August when the season actually starts. How much time at that point have you spent on, on each team? Three hours, four hours. Okay. You know, it takes me it takes me two hours probably to do the writing in the notebook of the three authors that I decided to use that year, and then uh, another probably hour to do a regular season win total and a base number and a base total, and then tracking returning starters, uh, any coaching changes, especially coordinators, uh, probably another hour. So four hours each team, three or four hours each team. And then are you going back, like, you know, when the season actually starts and you start seeing actual games and going through box scores, are you referring back to your notes a lot? Or is it more like, hey, I got it all. I'm just moving forward from here. So I'll show you a, um, just like a, a quick thing of what the notebook actually is. But as you can see, I have strengths and weaknesses, which is what I use for every single uh, team. And those are pertinent towards box scores. So if in like week one or week two, a team strength is supposed to be pass defense and they're getting torched through the air, they have to change their rating and their strength and weaknesses. So it's, um, it's easier to do that during the year than actually before the year, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, when you're doing box score and you're, you're looking at every single game and, and trying to focus on all the positives and negatives, um, it's, it's much easier to adjust a number on the fly right then um, by a point or two or something like that than it is in August when you're completely blind to what that team might look like. Yeah, I think you wrote an article about the notebook. I want to say it was, I don't know if it was last year or the season before, um, in depth. I mean, if you guys want to, you know, you guys listen and want to find that, you can just probably Google Eddie Wall's notebook. There's an article at Better IQ that kind of breaks it down in a little more detail and probably gives a, some more, some more, uh, info to, to get off that but it's great i mean i've seen it you've, you've given it to me to look at i mean it's it's fascinating how much information you have packed in that notebook i mean you probably have three pages worth of notes on one page because it's so small and you're squeezing it all in so it's really more like 1500 pages than it is 500 pages i feel like. right right it's yeah, amazing it's, it's definitely a lot of information there's not a lot that gets past me at this point point. and i have to imagine like you just writing it all probably helps you learn and you know, get it into your brain more than if you just like copy and paste it from an article or, you know, or just read stuff online. The fact that you're writing it down has to have some value to it, I would imagine, right? Yeah. So like 2017, uh, it was kind of an experiment, but I did a baseball season. I do everything by notebook, baseball, basketball, football, um, baseball is a hundred pitchers, uh, basketball, all 30 teams. And I track every box score for every pitcher, blah, blah, blah. So that baseball season, I decided no notebook. I'm just going to take, I'm just going to do focus on college football and I'm just going to bet with what I already know in baseball. And I had a horrendous season. Like, and it was just a learning experience for me. You know, it's like, this is what works. Uh, don't differ from it, you know? So like, I have to write it out. Like I don't retain the information the same way that most people do. Like I can't just read an article and say, okay, this is what's going to happen this year. I have to actually highlight it and then write it. Like, you know, if it's pertinent, then I want to know about it and I want it to be in there. Otherwise, I just don't feel, you know, I've never had a losing football season. Um, so until I do, I'm not going to change anything, you know, even though it's just painstaking at times. Like last night, I really didn't want to write. Like there's just nights when you don't, but, you know, it beats the hell out of, you know, starving to death. Yeah. Well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Keep yeah, it right. Going. Uh, <laughs> just, just keep making it better. I mean, so I've talked about coaches a lot at the outset here. Um, 
you know, I focus more on the NFL, but I mean, coaches are huge in, in college football as well. Um, I know you're a big coaches guy, so um, I'm sure that's a big part of, of the notebook. And I know you just recently had a little, you want to tell you a little story about Texas Tech's head coach here? <laughs> what happened last, oh, last man, week or so? That's an embarrassing story. Okay, so I woke up yesterday at like 8.30 in the morning getting ready to go hiking, and I log on to Twitter, and they had some article that Coach Duggerton at Texas Tech uh, had take, uh, taken the job at Texas Tech after leaving USC as OC, and I'm like, wait a second, I don't remember Duggerton being the offensive coordinator at USC. Who is this guy? And they had this long article on him, and they had a picture of him walking Texas Tech players out on the field. At some point, he was the offensive coordinator there, I guess, and all this stuff, it turns out to be some kind of spoof off of a video game or something like that created by bar school. But I literally lost my mind for like 10 minutes Googling who this guy was and what happened to Matt Wells. Matt Wells is still the coach. So I'm like, how is this possible that like Wikipedia hasn't even caught on to this, you know? And then it finally clicked. And uh, But it, it's a catastrophe when somebody, when a coach does get fired or when he resigns in the middle of the summer because I have to rip that page out and start all over because coaches are the most important parts of me. They, they mean everything to a base total and base numbers. So I literally thought, okay, well, there went my hike today. I've got to stay home and rewrite Texas Tech's page, which I have probably 50% of the way done. And you're looking at not just the head coach, but also the coordinators, their right. background history. I mean, special teams probably a little bit as well, right? I mean, you're looking at every aspect. Not special teams. I don't really care about special teams too much unless it's a coach that focuses on special teams. Like Whittingham, his special teams coordinator, is probably going to become a head coach somewhere at some point. Urban Meyer was the same way. Those two or th There's a handful of guys in college football that really specialize in special teams and really find it important. But for the most part, I stay away from it because it's just too much to write and it usually ends up not being overly uh, – I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me to do it. But offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, and age of a head coach and background of a head coach are all the things that I focus on. Um, I, I probably spend more time on coaches than anything else. Um, any kind of new coach, whether it's a new member on the staff or whatever, will get a write-up in my notebook automatically because I know that they didn't bring them in for no reason. I mean, uh, and now that a lot of the times nowadays you're finding the coaches only have one, you know, background their entire life and they don't know how to coach one side of the ball. So if they make a bad hire on, on a coordinator, I, I, I take special account for that. So that's, you that's mentioned really age. That's kind of interesting. So you, the age of the coach is, is a factor you think has a humongous to factor. In college football, a humongous factor. Anybody that's over the age of 55 or has had the tenure for longer than 10 years, um, you'll notice that they go through coordinators quickly. And also they, they hire, uh, they kind of take chances on guys because they don't want to coach as much. I mean, it's just a matter of life. You know, you get older and uh, you don't have the same energy that you had when you first started a job 15 years ago. It doesn't make a difference if you're a football coach or a teacher or whatever in any walk of life. Um, so, yeah, no, age is a big deal to me. Um, I also look for divorces, child custody battles. Uh, yeah, I'm a weirdo like that, but I really believe in it. You know, when Jimbo yeah. Fisher, Jimbo Fisher, man, when he was at Florida State and he was going through a custody battle, it was the worst year of his life. I didn't think they were going to be any good, and, and they were miraculously bad. So I look for anything I can find an edge on. Yeah, that's, that's great. Digging into personal life sometimes pays dividends for sure. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about in the season now. So let's say we're in the season – and you're trying to stay on top of all 130 teams. How difficult is that? And, and kind of what do you do to make sure you don't miss anything, nothing falls through the cracks? So um, uh, college football schedule for me during the season is pretty, pretty fun for me. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. Like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't try this at home. If you, have a, if, you have, if you have a quicker method or a more efficient method, then go for it. But um, I usually start at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday after I've hit openers. I make numbers on Thursday, um, and I'm pretty confident in my numbers on Thursday. But, uh, and then on Sunday is where the real work begins. Uh, I start at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I work until 2 o'clock in the morning, logging every single box score that I can possibly find. I also review games that maybe I didn't find. I just look for highlights on YouTube or a quick synopsis, uh, just quick plays stuff like that. And then Monday is when I hit totals. And then as soon as I get done hitting totals, I usually head to the library or Whole Foods, something to get myself out of the office because I've been in the office for three days straight, basically. And um, I'll work on uh, more box scores. I'll complete all the box scores on Monday. I'll do another 12-hour day, usually in a public place with headphones on, listening to music. And then on Tuesday is when I start making numbers. Um, for that week, I start reviewing all of the numbers. 
And I'll show you really quick what goes into making numbers. I think I've tweeted something before, but it really wasn't that in-depth. So this would be, um, basically, I have six sets of numbers here. And all those numbers are basically, all, I use six different people um, throughout, you know, throughout the off season. So it only makes sense that I would have six different opinions on how the game's going to play out. You'll notice that none of the numbers really go by more than three points. So it allows me to create a base. And then at the very end here will be the final number of what the game will be. And then that will be the end result. So I have every single game. And um, this will come in handy throughout the week. I can just look at this and this will be my final numbers, basically your final answer, if you will. Uh, how, how, how does watching the games, like, you know, I know you watch a lot of games too. I mean, are you taking notes during the games? Or are you writing things down or are you just not backing that in as much? No, no, I take notes during certain games, especially uh, weeks one through eight. After that, I don't take as many notes. But, you know, a lot of the times, uh, so many games can be misleading, you know. Um, I, there was, there's so many games where you see that, like, a, a team out gained another team by 200 yards, but lost the game ultimately, and you don't know why. You have to go back and be able to watch that game to see if they missed a field goal, and then they turned the ball over close to the other team's goal line and stuff like that. I think that you learn a lot in the first four to six, you know, first four to six weeks about teams, especially I don't have a great feel for certain conferences. I always had a great feel for the small conferences, but I don't, I don't pretend to be like a big 12 or an SEC expert because I'm never going to find outlandish numbers in those games. So I do have to keep closer attention to those games. So I try to watch as many of those games as I can. I'm, you know, the Mac I, I, and the Sun Belt and the Mountain West Conference, I usually have such a feel that I'm just watching those in bits and pieces, unless I have a, a, a larger bet than normal in one of the games. Yeah, makes sense. So I talked a lot about injuries too before before I brought you on here. For me in the NFL, I'm a big injuries guy. I'm looking at injury reports multiple times a week, and the reporting in the NFL is pretty good. Where in college, I know it's it's much tougher to find those. But for the NFL, I mean, I'm I'm digging in there. I'm figuring who the backup is. I'm kind of making a number based off of that, and and then I'll look at it again later in the week and see if anything's changed. You get the official reports. So um what about you in college i mean injury is a big part of what you do or or is it more just depending on the game of the team or what's your process so, uh, with with college football i think it's really great um to note that depth is probably one of the biggest things that you have to work with if a team has bad depth uh like for instance they only have uh dbs and their backups that are going to be freshmen and sophomores you want to take note for that um the difference in speed in college compared to high school is too much for a freshman to understand um, week six of a college football season. He's being put there because somebody else got hurt. He wasn't expecting to play probably this entire year. Now all of a sudden he's playing. So um, I look for uh, DBs, uh, any kind of cornerback or safety injury, especially in lower mid-conferences, you know, mid-level conferences. Any Conference USA cornerback or safety that goes out, I'm probably going to bet the other team at some point on one way or the other, uh, whether it be a total or a side. Um, and then, of course, quarterbacks and any kind of key player that goes down, I have a number for um, already, and I can adjust that really quickly. But um, I, you said earlier when I was listening to you that linebacker, a middle linebacker goes down in college football. I don't care about linebackers. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there are a dime a dozen, and unfortunately, they just don't rank that well in college football. Um, there's yeah. a few that stand out every single year, but the majority, like a middle Tennessee linebacker, I'm not going to move the number because, you know, the starting linebacker went down. Do you think, I mean, Don Best, you know, as I feel like they've tailed off a lot the last few years of the injuries, no, especially in college awesome. basketball. Yeah. Same for football? Oh, yeah. Don Best is terrible. Um, I mean, there, there's no denying it at this point. Um, but it's a monopoly, and they do provide a service. Um, you know, you have to work with what you're given. Um, but there, there's been many times where I, I felt that they did better is really wrong. Um, there was times last college football season where things were kind of absurd, for sure. Um, you know, I remember specifically that Nevada's quarterback wasn't playing, um, and, you know, you had to learn it from Twitter. And it was not – Don Best also had uh, Hunter Johnson uh, injured at, at Northwestern when he wasn't um, in week one. Um, thankfully, I was on the under, and things went well, and he turned out to not to be a good quarterback last year. But, I mean, things like that are really avoidable, you know. I think that they could just put a little bit more effort forth. Yeah, it's gotten – I mean – each year, the last three, four years, I think it's just dropped off like a little by little. I mean, now it's the point where for college basketball, I think they're missing half the injuries, I feel like. And I don't know about football, but it's that severe, but it's bad. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, who's going to stop them? They have a monopoly, you know. I mean, what, what, what are you going to go to? I mean, yeah, it's just what it is. I, I hate to say it, but I mean, uh, I find out more information using um, the Athletic, you know, from their beat writers um, than I do Don Best sometimes, and that that sucks. But you know, for five hundred bucks a month, I think they could do a little better. I think everybody could agree on that. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, so what about schedule? So one of the things I mentioned, you know, kind of comparing and contrasting the NFL and college football is that the schedule is way more important in college given the disparity in the team. So how do you account for some of these games where you get these lopsided, you know, point spreads or just a team playing a really tough schedule non-conference before they get into conference season? How do you kind of – those adjustments are – I know they're, they're, they're difficult to make in college. And how do you kind of go about that process? Well, I, I, I circle certain teams or I put a star next to every single team that I think they're going to struggle against or, or teams that they'd be looking ahead to. Um, I, you know, I think that that's really important in college handicapping. Um, you know, I think that, like, you're, for the, you know, Clemson is never going to take seriously anybody until they have to in the ACC. So, uh, you know, I'm more likely to gain, you know, to, to grab points with Wake Forest if I know that uh, they have Virginia Tech on the road the next week, uh, you know, they're, they're laying 40 points or something like that. I'll take a chance on the dog knowing that they're probably preparing for Virginia Tech the following week and Wake Forest is just something that they have to deal with in the meantime. Stuff like that. Um, I, I try, you know, I start making totals for certain teams in my head because I look at a matchup and say, oh my God, that's going to be a great under or that's going to be a great over in the middle of July. Like you can just look while you're doing preview work and, and see it that far ahead because you, you see how these teams match up with one another. You know, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, uh, last year, neither team had a defensive back. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of fun, you know. But, I mean, it, 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 you can't get too far ahead of yourself at the same time, you know, especially if you don't have a good read on a team, which happens to me sometimes. Like, I was doing Tennessee work last night, and I kept up thinking this was going to be a great under. And they'll probably be the best over in college football this year because I, you know, I'm already so far ahead of myself. So <laughs> that's just the way it works. You got to keep things in perspective at all times. Do you throw a lot of games out, like based on the schedule? Like if Alabama's playing some, like you know, Tulane or somebody in the fifty point. Do you even bother with looking at that game, or do you say, you know what, I don't care what happens in this game? No, I mean I look at every game. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't ever find any value in Alabama though. I don't, you know, I make the number and I'm no, I never have a discrepancy. I, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I tell you, that's why I have to do uh, NFL work this year because I don't know how many teams in college football are going to call it a season before, you know, they, they have to, but, um, it, it's just shocking to me when I look at Ohio state, Alabama, Clemson, uh, there's a few others, Georgia, I, I, the limited amount of plays that I have per season with those teams is unbelievable. I don't even know why I do the preseason work. I think they've had maybe 10 plays in eight years with Alabama, other than like championship games and stuff like that, where you're pushing your discrepancy, you know, because you have one game left in the season, you might push your discrepancy level a little bit and say, well, I got to make a play somewhere here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the most part, I'm not going to, you know, I probably make more plays in one year with Eastern Michigan than I am with Alabama over the course of a decade. So yeah, it makes yeah. Sense. yeah, but I mean, if I find an edge, I'm playing it, you know, if Tulane's getting 48 and I made it 45, we're, we're going to be on the green wave. So you, you kind of alluded to it here just a minute ago about, about this season coming up. I mean, A, do you, think we'll, do you think we'll have a college football season? And if we do, how many teams? What's it going to look like? Well, I mean, I think we'll have a season. Um, I don't – there's a lot of things going on that a lot of uh, – I told you this privately, but I'll say it publicly. I can't believe that these writers aren't pushing out every bit of information that they could. If I worked at an Athlon, I'd have six magazines lined up. I mean – it's unbelievable to me. I put out any story. People are so thirsty for information and just even read about something that would make them feel good would be a good buy at this point. Um, but uh, people are forgetting that ESPN gave Sunbelt uh, a humongous contract for Sunbelt standards last year, and all their games will be televised on ESPN Plus uh, this season. Sunbelt's in a really tricky situation. If they don't play this season, you're going to lose a lot of schools. They just don't have the money. They lost New Mexico State because New Mexico State couldn't fly their players and staff. Um, and that conference has a lot of teams like that. So I think you're probably going to see the Sun Belt as far as uh, – and the MAC because the MAC needs action. And you saw that MAC let go of all their track and field and all their soccer and everything. They have to have some kind of sports in order to stay uh, somewhat on the map. Uh, Mountain West Conference is in trouble, obviously. Um, you know, Colorado State said that they're only going to have online classes. San Jose said, State said that they're preparing for football. 
San Diego State doesn't look like they're preparing for football. I don't know. It's just as much as anybody else doesn't know. I think that you will see the SEC obviously have a season. So I'm doing a lot of SEC work, which is boring and mind numbing, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that you'll I think that you'll see the powerhouses really push to play no matter what. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see a lot of Conference USA play this year. Um, they're just, they're a really, really small conference, but they don't have the resources and they don't have a TV contract. So that that's sad because I've done a lot of work, but now that I like all those teams and there's some good co coaches and good teams in that conference that, you know, probably deserve to have a season just as much as anybody else. But let's face it, UTEP just doesn't have the resources uh, during a pandemic to have tests and no, no, nobody in the stands. And it's just sad. It's the way it is. Yeah, I think you're right, too, about, you know, some of these teams don't play this year. They have to cut out all their sports or the school might be in trouble, might go under, you know, in yeah. total because they, just, they rely so much on that football revenue. It's like 90 percent of their budget comes from football. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I think you will see the SEC and, and a lot of the bigger conferences do whatever it takes. Um, you know, West Virginia already said they're playing no matter what, you know, and, and I think the reality is that they probably can't survive without football. So. Yeah. And the SEC is basically like the NFL. I mean, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they could call it college football, but it's, it's the NFL, you know. So, yeah, I get it. And yeah, so let's say we have a season. Let's say we get, you know, 90 teams playing or something like that. Sure. What do you think about the impact on these teams, given that we have the virus going on, they're not going to have all their spring workouts, and, you know, who knows when they'll get back on the field to practice. How do you think that will impact this season and some of those teams? Well, I mean, I like the challenge of it all. I've thought about all these scenarios for the last three months every single night. And I mean, honestly, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to be attacking teams that have quarterback battles coming up this year um, because they just don't get enough reps. Um, you know, even if it's voluntary workouts, they're, they're still not going to be, you know, the mandatory. If you tell a 20 year old that he has to be in shape then he gets in just enough shape, you know, but I mean, I, I'm going to be attacking teams um, that don't have a lot of experience and have quarterback battles. And, um, you know, your home field advantages, you have to change uh, quite drastically in certain places, for sure. Um, it's one thing if you have an Appalachian state who has a, a field of 20,000 with nobody there. It's another thing if you have Ohio State who has 136,000 empty seats. Um, you know, there's a humongous difference. Um, and the reason why home field advantages, I, in my opinion, I've always thought this, and college are bigger, college football are bigger than anywhere else, is because you have 19 year olds that have never played in front of this many people before, and they are hated when they take the field. Uh, you take that away, it, it does make a pretty big uh, degree of variance. You know, I mean, I think I think we're going to see a lot of, yeah, I, I think everybody's going to be a little confused on how to make home field advantages. But I spent, I don't know, a week looking at a home field advantage and how I would change every single home field advantage. And it was really great work. I, I really got a lot out of it. Yeah, I don't, so I don't look at college football and I focus more on the NFL when it comes to football. I've noticed in the NFL that home field advantage the last few years has diminished each year. There's this trend. And last year, actually, in 2019, in the NFL, the road teams outscored the home teams by okay. 0 0.1 points per game. So basically it's flat. No home field advantage whatsoever last year in the NFL. Now, I think that was more of an anomaly. They'll probably still have a home field two points, two and a half points long term. But now with the virus, no fans, I mean, it's going to impact the NFL and college football. Do you think – I mean, do you have an idea of, like, you know – are we going to have some teams that basically have zero home field advantage? I mean, is that, is that possible? In well, we've had teams for the last three years in my work that have had no home field advantage. As a matter of fact, we've had reverse home field advantage uh, two years in a row for UConn. Um, I've actually moved them to a negative one when they play at home. Um, their home field advantage has been a negative one because when people do show up, it's only out of anger and to boo them. Um, <laughs> and that's a lot of pressure. And I'm not kidding. I mean, that's been a reality for the last two wow. years at UConn. Um, and they're, they, you know, they were setting records as low as like, you know, 6,800 people going to the game and they all had fan, you know, they all had signs and everything like that. Home field advantage can work against teams when they're really bad. Um, and when they're really young and inexperienced. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, all of the Mac probably didn't have a humongous home field advantage. Um, especially when you look at teams that only took a bus, you know, 60 miles, stuff like that. But, um, as far as big schools. I think that there's still going to be a small home field advantage uh, just based on the fact that a lot of these kids have never traveled before and they're used to playing in front of their, you know, friends and family and stuff like that. 
Um, I don't know. It might disappear. It might disappear altogether by the end of next year. We've never seen times like these. Yeah, it's going to be a new territory. It's going to be kind of fun. I mean, I like. You mentioned it's a challenge. You'll enjoy the challenge. I mean, I like when things change. You know, I think it creates opportunities, and, and the market's going to be a little behind on it. I feel like so if you pick up on how it's impacting the teams before everybody else does, you might find a couple of good bets, you know, week one, week two, that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So yeah, I like it, you know, and maybe, I mean, you know, it could, a lot of things could be impacted. I mean, without not, not having practicing like they usually are before the season, maybe the offenses are a little behind what they usually are. They're not clicking, they, you know, it's just not, the chemistry is not there. Or maybe it's the defenses that are more behind. You know, we just don't know a lot of these things until we actually see some games where we're more speculating. But, Again, it's the bookmakers are speculating too, so we're all kind of in this together. Uh, but I always like that advantage where there's a lot of unknowns and things are, are very difficult to, to to break down. I would much rather have that than when you know it's just consistent all the time and everybody kind of knows what to expect because again, it's easier to handicap that way and the lines are a lot tighter. So I think we'll have both in you know all, actually all sports, you know NFL, college football, NBA when it comes back, you know will be a little different and, and soccer's come back now. We're seeing some differences. So yeah, it's, it makes for interesting handicap and it really, you know, again, it creates opportunities if you do it right. Yeah. Yeah. The degree of handicapping and variance is probably going to be a little bit different this year than anything we've ever experienced before, but I, I, I don't shy away from that at all. You know, do you think you'll be firing like your normal, like week one bet sizes, or you think you're going to take like a little bit step back and say, let me just go on a little bit slower and wait and see, or you just, and jump in and say, hey, this is it. I'm really hoping we have a baseball season just because I believe that a lot of betting is tempo, uh, tempo based, you know, and, and confidence based. Um, I, I would like to be able to have some baseball to make sure that, you know, I, I can see things properly. Um, if that happens, then obviously I'll just be betting what I normally do. Um, but, you know, I mean, I guess we don't have baseball season and I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know. I mean, I have limited time and as a college football handicapper. You have 17 weeks to get it right. You know, it's not like baseball where you have, you know, so much time and stuff like that, or even basketball. Um, so, no, I, I imagine that, you know, I probably in my mind want to take things slow, but I know I won't. I mean, I'm, I'm just being honest. I'm, I'm probably going to bet whatever I normally do. Right, right. All right, let's jump in here. Some questions here. We've got a handful of questions here, and uh, we'll start going through these. If anybody else has a question out there, Definitely now is the time to ask it. So first question here is talking about NFL and NFL injuries and where you kind of find those at, where the official injuries are at. So I'll take that. So I use Don Best. Don Best is pretty good for NFL. I mean, they definitely missed stuff. They're a little bit slow. Um, NFL.com has the official injury reports later in the week. Um, Pro Football Talks got a lot of injury stuff. Um, the fantasy sites are probably – if you're not using something like Don Best, the fantasy sites are pretty much on it, like, you know – especially when skill position players, but even like the offensive line and defensive players, they're, they're pretty good depending on what site you go on uh, for that. What about for, for, for college, Eddie? I mean, if you're not looking at Don Best, are there other sites you look at for college football that are, that are helpful for injuries? Yeah, the Athletic um, has a beat writer for just about every single team. Uh, you just have to, you have to search for their team. Um, you'll be able to find, a lot of the times you'll be able to find information that isn't even on Don Best. But uh, there's a writer that's specifically on The Athletic that only does non-Power 5 uh, injuries. And uh, he's pretty good. He, he led me some winners in the MAC uh, two or three years ago. They're good. Um, SB Nation used to be really good. I haven't checked them out in the last couple of years. Um, then again, I hear they're disbanding and they're letting go of all of their writers. I imagine they'll probably let go of their team-by-team -team writers as well. Um, yeah, and then Don Best, obviously. I mean, you know, you don't have to pay for Don Best to get their um, – their injury report. You can just Google Don Best injuries for that, whatever sport you want to do. NBA. Yeah, good point. I forgot they have that on their homepage, so we can yeah. do it for all sports. Um, right. Twitter. If you're, if you're not big into watching line moves and stuff like that, and you're just tracking uh, injuries, you can go to, you can just Google Don Best injuries. What about Twitter? Do you follow beat writers on Twitter and use that at all? Or is that? No, not anymore. Um, the problem is, is that they just have too biased of opinion. Um, and, and, and a lot of the times they only tell you what the coach is going to tell them. So uh, it became pointless. I was tracking 130 beat writers, I think, in 2018, and I don't think that I gained anything from it. You know, I, I'd wake up every single day and I'd read for an hour and a half, and, and then I'd go to Don Best. And, by, you know, they, don't, they only report anything until Thursday or Friday anyway, a day or two before the game. By then, I've either already made a bet, passed on a bet, or, you know, whatever. And the, the market's moved against me at that point, so. 
Yeah, that's a really good point about Twitter because I find myself sometimes going on Twitter. Maybe maybe there's a game. I just want to Google something or uh, search something on Twitter. Or I'll look for a certain beat writer, and all of a sudden, an hour and fifteen minutes go by, and I'm still on Twitter. I'm like, I just went down a rabbit hole, and now I'm like <laughs> yeah. looking at videos of cats or something. All of a sudden, it's always like, suck you in, man. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's ridiculous. Yeah, you got to be careful with Twitter. Yeah. Like, there's just so much there; it, it clouds you, and you just time lapses so fast. So I, I try to stay away from Twitter once we get into a season, unless I'm looking for something very specific. College yeah. basketball I have to be because injuries are there, and it's sometimes the only place to find them. But be careful on Twitter; you can definitely uh, end up spending too much of your day there. Oh yeah. Uh, all right, this one's for you, Eddie. So you mentioned earlier that you that you make box scores or read them. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you mean when you say make make box scores? Is it you, do you no, no. I just that? write down the box score and then I study the box score. So in other words, I want to make sure that I'm reading everything correctly after I write it down. Um, I'm copying it from uh, Yahoo app on my phone, and then you know I have it on my laptop as well. And I'll just write the box score, but I want to make sure that I actually retain the information that I read from the box score. So I'll spend a couple minutes with each game, um, you know. There's things that stick out to you in box scores where you go, that can't be right, and you have to find the game on YouTube or wherever you possibly can to make sure that that's actually right. There was a game two years ago where a team outgained another team by 300 yards and lost the game by three points in overtime, and I couldn't figure out how. So I had to watch that whole game. It was enthralling, though. It was a great game. What about the game recaps? Do you ever read those, or are they just not not very useful? Usually I watch 60% of the games. So, I mean – Unless the game recap has something that I, you know, if I can't find out what happened in a game by looking at the box score and seeing exactly how one team dominated or one team lost or anything like that, YouTube is wonderful nowadays. You can go on YouTube, look up game highlights or game recap, and it will show you everything that you need to know from any school just about. So, Yeah, that's a good tip for sure. Yeah. Have you bet any game of the year lines yet for college football? Yeah, I mean, I, I – the degenerate in me says yes. <laughs> I don't want to admit it, but yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the thing that's funny about Game of the Year lines is that, you know, they offer you value, but the limits are so small that, you know, I, I don't know if there's just that much edge in it anymore, you know. I guess if, if you're trying to build a bankroll and stuff like that, you can find some things. There was only two that I just had to take a shot at because they were just so far away from what I thought they should be. Same thing with regular season win totals this time of year, you know. You bet. Yeah, I, I'll give everybody one because I, I, I don't know if the number's there anymore, and I bet it for a dime, and I'm sure they moved it, but Arkansas State regular season win total was only six and a half. I made it eight, and that was being conservative. So, I mean, I bet a couple of regular season win totals. I bet a couple of game of the year lines, but it, these aren't real bets, and, you know, I hope to get a return of investment on them because, you know, I'm doing the work and everything like that. But let's face it, when the, by the time those type, game of the year comes a lot – Lines come around, you might have seven seven points the best of it, but you really didn't get down the amount that you wanted to. So that's what's happening with me, at least. I mean, some people have outs and they can bet humongous amounts. But yeah, yeah. if you got a lot of credit, I mean, I guess you yeah. make more of a case for it. But yeah, this, this year's kind of weird. I mean, I, you got to be careful with with futures bets, you know, season win right. totals and games of the year because you know, the schedule could end up changing or they don't play a full season. You got to make sure you look at the rules for your sports book. And right, that's true. Yeah, I happens. didn't think about that. That's scary. I didn't think about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they'll refund me, but let's hope. It. Yeah, that's the, the general rule is they don't play the entire schedule. You get you get a push. But I've had, I've had it in other sports where, like NBA, for instance, I played um, season win totals for years. And then one year, this just made me so mad. So it was Boston and Indiana. For some reason, their game got canceled. I want to say it was like five years ago. What? It got canceled for weather or something bad. Okay. And I had a season win total on both of those teams that both would have won. But since they oh. played 81 of the 82 games, never made up that game, Yeah, I lost. But for baseball, I know they only have to play 160. So they can miss right. two games and it's still a bet. So it depends on which sport. And you got to make sure you know that uh, definitely going into it. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question for you, Eddie. How many plays – do you make on average on a Saturday? Uh, th- well, 30 plays throughout a week is probably average for me. Um, you know, that's t- counting totals and sides, and some bets are much bigger and much smaller, you know. Um, I would probably say I make 45 to 50% of my bets I open, um, and then throughout the week, I'm just constantly adding um, bet plays. 
Um, some plays, you know, I end up going back and saying I didn't have enough down. You know, I didn't get enough down at open, so I have to bet it again. Uh, stuff like that. But, yeah, I would probably say 25 to 30. Live betting, second halves, to get into that? No, only, only full game in college. Um, yeah. NBA, I, I do first half and second half um, quite often to lower my variance. Um, well, I have in the past. I didn't this last year because I had a really good year, and I was, you know, I kind of on a good run for the entire season. But, um, yeah, no, in college, I just feel like I have such the best of it um, with my numbers that I really don't want to mess around with anything. You know, I'll let the chips lie where they fall. All right, so continuing with the UConn theme here, I know returning starters is a metric most used when coming up with power numbers. How do you account for a team like UConn, who may have eight or so returning starters on defense, but last year's D was historically bad? Yeah, I mean, um, well, actually, UConn was pretty decent on, uh, he's thinking about 2018, which was, or 2019, which was, no, 2018, which was the worst defense, yeah, ever until UMass came along last year and smashed that record. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically what you want to do is, um, if you're going to start taking college football really, really serious, I start tracking recruits and their, uh, stars, star recruits, you know, every single team, just a little by little, you don't have to put hours and hours into it. But if you see that UConn has, you know, four walk-ons that are <laughs> return starters, they're probably not going to be good. Return starting doesn't mean anything if there's no production behind it. Um, so you want to combine the two. Um, and luckily, nowadays, um, you can find returning starting production uh, basically everywhere. I mean, a lot of places track it. Football Outsiders tracks it. Um, so it doesn't make a difference if you have a lot of restarting, returning starters if they're bad. If they're only good at losing and that's all they've ever experienced, it, it, it sometimes can do you really a lot of harm by, have, by following the returning production or returning starters uh, solely. You want to look at talent levels. You want to look at coaching and um, make your numbers based upon that. And also, you know, a lot of research on what people think or people are gonna tell you about the team before you just look at returning starters. We've got a question here from the Raz Slack chat here. How do you find Jamar Smith? Uh, this is Boom Goes Dynamite, I don't know who that is, but Me neither. How, did, how did you find Jamar Smith, quarterback, and the number one wide receiver of LA or Louisiana Tech yeah. Three days before Don Best ever released him, and the wide receiver was suspended. Are you reading through all the team pages, forums? How did you find these before Don Best? Yeah, so um, with Louisiana Tech, it was uh, – whenever something like that occurs, you have to realize that I'm looking at these teams, and I will, like – there was a really weird situation with uh, Jamar Smith. You can look on my Twitter, and I would talk to him on Twitter all the time because I was a fan of us. And I try to talk to a lot of kids on uh, Twitter that I really think are worthy of it. You know, if they have a really good game, then I try to tell them so and stuff like that. But Jamar Smith was really kind of a special one. And the fact that he doesn't have a lot of Twitter followers and I would say great game and he'd say thanks. And it was super weird. But anyways, what happened with him and Louisiana Tech is I knew that there was something up on Monday. They, they played on Thursday and um, on Monday when their coach spoke to the press, he didn't want to talk about what was going on with the team, even though it was like a Thursday night game that was coming on. He didn't want to discuss anything. It was very, very odd. And um, I knew right then that there was something going on. I don't watch pressers or anything like that, but it was really weird to me that like it was, I don't remember if it was Twitter or something like that, but it was very clear that this guy was trying not to talk to the press about the team. So I just kept on digging and I kept on Googling every five or six hours, you know, like key players, uh, suspensions, uh, injuries, blah, blah, blah. I found out on Tuesday that they had some kind of scandal going on and there were three key players that were going to be suspended. Um, and I didn't know it was going to be Jamar Smith by any means. And I didn't ask him, you know, if he was suspended, I don't think he would have answered me anyway. But um, I just took a guess because there was only three key players on Louisiana Tech that would affect the line. And, um, I got fortunate enough that I guessed right, basically. There was, you know, I mean, there was, it was probably 80%, you know, I'd probably say 20% luck because, you know, who are the other three key players? There's, you know, Louisiana Tech doesn't have anybody that's going to the NFL the next year. And they have a quarterback that's really good. They have a running back that's really good. And they had a linebacker and a defensive end that were, you know, above average. But, you know, what were they going to do? They're going to suspend a wide receiver nobody's ever heard of and call him a key player. So that's all that was. Yeah, I think I mean in general. I mean, if you're if you're following these sports in in you know, 
betting for a living or betting at a very high level, very sophisticated level, and you're looking at these teams day and day, you're going to find stuff from time to time before other people know about it. I mean, college basketball, even more so, I feel like, because there's so many small schools and small conferences, you'll run into something just on accident or see something on Twitter that is totally unreported anywhere. And it's, that's obviously a huge advantage. It's one of those things that's the more you, the more time you spend, the more rocks you turn over, eventually you're going to find something really good and you can hammer that and, and you know, make a lot of money. So let's keep your eyes open for sure. A uh, couple more questions here. So do you find yourself betting on game day at all or all of your bets made early in the week? Yeah, no, I bet on game day. Um, there'll be a lot of times where I wake up on Saturday morning. Well, I don't normally even sleep on Friday night because I'm pretty nervous or I just, you know, anxious, whatever. I suffer from insomnia. So if you need somebody to talk to at like 4 a.m. during college football season, I'm probably your guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you're call me at 4 a.m. <laughs> talk to somebody at 9 a.m., there's no chance it's going to be me. But um, – Anyways, uh, no, I, I, I'll wake up at 9.30 and sometimes the, the moves just don't make sense to me. And that's where I end up fading a lot of the market. Um, you know, uh, there was a couple of times last year where there was just some absurd things going on on Saturdays. So I started paying attention more times than not on Saturdays. Uh, I try to make all of my plays by Thursday and then take Friday off to kind of relax and get my mind right. I usually go and play poker or do something that I enjoy on Friday night. But uh, there were times last year where I don't know who was messing around with the market, but I don't know if they were trying to middle or what was going on. But there was probably better value on Saturdays than there was on Monday or Tuesday. Got it. Got it. All right. So when making your power numbers, if all of a sudden a team, a really good team gets blown out, how do you decide by how much to adjust? Is it? I is never it... adjust a team by more than two points per week. Um, that's just been a rule for me because I got burned when I was younger where I, you know, I, 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 there was a couple of times, there was a couple of years where I think North Carolina and the ACC, there was a couple in the ACC that would just get blown out, um, you know, and I would go crazy and move their number down by like six points. And you can't do that. You can't react, you know, you can't overreact too much. Now, if a team loses, you know, week one and gets blown out and looks awful, um, I move them down two points. If they go out week two and play against a, a similar ranked opponent that I had and they get blown out again, then that's, that's different. I'm going to have to move that rapidly and quickly and probably not bet them, um, you know, that week or make any plays in their games because obviously my number is wrong and I don't, you know, there's always one team every single year that really gets me. Last year, FIU got me really bad. Uh, Penn State is the notorious one with me and Bink where we lost eight games with Penn State one year. Um, you know, there's certain things that you just can't really control if you're making good numbers. Um, you're going to win a lot more than bad if you do a lot of research and make good numbers. But there's always going to be one or two teams that get away from you. And I would tell anybody, if you're looking to move a team too far up or too far down, take caution and maybe wait a week. Yeah, no, that's good advice for sure. There's always those teams. I mean, I have a new nemesis every year in, in, in every sport handicap. And, you know, you just nothing goes right. And, you know, no. maybe it's stubbornness. Maybe it's just bad luck. But uh, it's going to happen from time to time. Um, is there any way to calculate if your handicapping style will show a long-term profit? So I guess this one's a little bit more general, but I mean, for me, at least I'll answer it. Eddie, you can add on to this. I mean, your style, it depends how deep you go with your style, right? I mean, you could be a modeler, you could be an information hog, a game watch, whatever it is. The deeper you go into that style, you know, the better, obviously, that you're going to do. It's not necessarily the style, but it's how you apply that style. So I wouldn't say that, you know, if you're a modeler, you can expect to make a 3% ROI. If you're an information hog, 5%. It doesn't really work like that. It's about how you, you know, use your personal strengths and turn that into an edge. And that could be any style. It doesn't, there's no one right style or one way to handicap. I don't know, Eddie, if you want to tack out of that at all. Yeah, actually, um, I, I think that the best way to figure out whether or not you have, or how big your edge is, to, to calculate your closing line value um, every single month. Um, and I wouldn't do it uh, every single, I would do it every single week. And then, you know, once a month, really look at it from that angle. Um, you can control a lot of things, but if you can't, if you can't beat the game, if you can't beat the number, then you probably can't beat the game. So that's what I would, that's what I always tell everybody. If you have negative closing line value or just neutral closing line value, you might want to play less games and play less volume. But if you have the best of it uh, for a long period of time and you can see that within yourself, then you want to bet more games and bet more money. Yep. Yep. Makes total sense. I mean, yeah, if you have record, good record keeping, you can learn a lot from your, from your records. Um, all right. I'll get one or two more here, then we'll call it quits. Uh, 
how do you find out about head fake moves in college football, which, and how do you avoid them? I mean, I don't know how anybody does that, to be honest, but go ahead, give your, your answer, Eddie. Oh, uh, yeah, no problem. I know how to look for them. Um, I make them. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, uh, the, the best way to look for head fake moves is that they're always going to, they, they happen on a certain day of the week. I'm not going to say which, because that's silly of me to say that. Um, but your biggest head fakes, if you watch the screen a lot, you're going to notice which day that is, what time of day that is, and where they start. You want to look at the originate, your original book, where the line started moving from. And then you want to look at what the limits are at that book. Um, and that, that's become really significant in the last three years. Um, there was a book that took humongous bets that no longer takes humongous bets, but they still have a lot of control over the market. So um, if you're looking for head fakes, um, you know, just pay attention. Watch Don Best for every afternoon for a week, and um, you'll probably get pretty clued into it. All right, we'll close it out here with more of like a mental health kind of question, which is interesting because I don't think this gets talked about enough in, in sports betting, um, how much we go through as sports bettors, the ups and downs. So how does anxiety, you know, you mentioned anxiety earlier. How does that help, How does that lead to you reacting when you're going through a bad run? Does it change your handicapping? Does it change how you think? Or what do you? how do you do when you have that, that anxiety uh, kind mean, of building up? I don't know if anxiety is the right term for it. I think that every single better – or every single gambler on earth uh, deals with anxiety at some level. Some just deal with it differently and better. Um, I deal with an anxiety disorder. Um, but, you know, everything comes from confidence. If you're doing really well and you're working hard and you're seeing results, then it's easier to make more bets and easier to bet more money. If you're on a downswing, um, it's harder to make bets and harder to feel confidence. Um, so you just have, I tell everybody that goes through downswing or asks me questions about downswings, um, just bet less volume or bet less money until you feel that confidence return. And that's really all you can do. Um, poker players go through it more than sports bettors. We're fortunate as sports bettors that we usually have some time to recover. Um, poker games are only good, you know, certain times of day and maybe at certain locations and you ha you're forced to play even when you're not feeling at your best. Um, and sports betting, you know, whatever your sport is, you, you can take a break and it will be there the next day, you know. Um, so, yeah, as far as mental health goes, um, I always tell everybody, if you ever want to talk about anything anxiety wise or mental health wise, just DM me on Twitter. It's always available. I'll always answer anybody and everybody. Um, but, yeah, I, I go through I was hospitalized twice in uh, 2018 during football season. Eric knows that I'm not scared to talk about it. Um, and I just couldn't figure out what was going on with me. I lived 38 years and never really had any issues. And then out of nowhere, it was just like I couldn't control it. I couldn't breathe properly. Um, so, yeah, it's open. Anybody wants to talk about it, feel free. What's your Twitter handle, by the way, that you can give out so people can find you? Oh, it's uh, walls underscore Edward. Or you can just put in drink your milkshake. And you can look for me on Poker Stars or, Fol or Poker Stars every single night as well. And you can also find some of your content that you've written over the last couple of years at betteriq.com. If you want to learn more about college football, you do a weekly column. The last two years, we kind of recapped each week and kind of your thoughts and opinions. There's a lot of good stuff in there you can learn from as well. Uh, this was fun, Eddie. I appreciate you coming on, man. This was a blast. Yeah, no problem, man. Anytime. Yeah, this was fun. So we'll be back with our final session here on Thursday. We're going to have Lloyd Danzig on. We're going to talk about the future of sports betting, which will be a really interesting discussion. So don't want to miss that. Thanks everyone for coming on and we'll, we'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you.